Okay, you just wait for me to start. Alright, then I'm going to open this. Um, is it clear now? Um, the stay. Am I audible? Okay, thanks. Okay, uh, let's continue. So types of database, we have um, the relational database and the, uh, I'm getting small, yeah. Types of database, we have the relational database and uh, the cloud database. This is the broad term. We have many other kinds of databases, but uh, essentially they are grouped under these two, the relational database and the cloud database. Um, the relational database is made up of a set of tables, procedures, and triggers with data that fits into a predefined category or schema. So, um, in relational database, what we have is that there is a relationship that, that is present between a particular table and uh, between many other tables that are present in the uh, database. For instance, you could have a database where we have uh, four different tables. So, for, uh, for instance, Ten Academy database, we have the um, trainees table, we have the um, GMIT attendance table, we have the G class um, assignments table, and then we have the uh, rocket chart um, attendance um, table as well. So, all of these tables are relational. I mean, all the database that we run at Ten Academy is a relational database because these tables are connected in one way or another. And then it's just like what we have in our uh, in our uh, house. So for instance, we have the kitchen as our database. And then in the kitchen, we have, we have outlined where the cabinet is, where we are storing the, uh, not cabinet, sorry, where we are storing the, um, the utensils, where we are storing the, the, the gas cookers, where we are storing the, the plates, and where the food is and all of these things. So you can categorize all of these as tables that are present in the database with the kitchen being the database and all of these utensils, um, plates are called the tables that we have in the database. And it's similar for what we have in the relational database. And the example I gave was the uh, Ten, Academy, uh, Ten Academy database. Uh, procedures are what are set that, that, are, that are like set instructions that are supposed to run when something happens and then similar to triggers they are supposed to run when um, something's happen. An example of um, relational database is MySQL, Postgres, MSQL Server, SQLite and a host of many other relational databases. So what? Excuse me for interruption. Yeah. Would you make it uh, full screen? Um, the major issue with that is I have to go out of the presentation before I can admit other trainees to join. Oh, let's see. All right. Okay. Is this better now? Yes, much better. Okay. Thank yes. you. Yes. Thank you. So, like I have said, um, relational database are re uh, re uh, t uh, database that are related. So they have like a primary key that relates this table to the other table. They have the foreign key, which relates the other table to the next table. An example is what has been written here, my SQL, Postgres, and MSQL server. The cloud database is the other kind of database that we have. And then it's a type of database that typically runs on the cloud computing platform. And then the cloud service providers provides access to the database. So cloud database are generally they run on the cloud uh, on the cloud platform, and then the giant cloud um, service provider are the uh, AWS, which is uh, Amazon Web Services, um, uh, GCP, which is Google uh, Cloud Platform, and then the Microsoft Azure. These are the mo most uh, the top three um, giant company that runs the cloud. Uh, infrastructure right and then they have their host of many other databases for instance in AWS we have the Dino database we have the RDS database and many others uh, for Google Cloud Platform we have the uh, Google Big Table, Google Big Query, Google Spanner and many others uh, kind of database and all of these things 
the major the difference that exists between all of these different kind of database is um, some of them provide high availability, which means they provide a 99.9 percent .9 availability time, and it's not uh, it's not going down. Um, they they have high throughput. Some have larger memory storage than the others, and depending on your use case, will determine uh, which of these uh, database you would uh, purchase or pay for. And we also have the MongoDB Atlas, which is another cloud uh, database. And um, the the difference between the cloud database and the relational database is relational database can run on our local device, on our local um, storage, or on our uh, on our uh, infrastructure. But the cloud, uh, the cloud service provider, uh, manages access to this, and then they ensure that they, um, they secure it, they ensure that it's always available, they ensure that you get access to it. What this means is that cloud database does not necessarily, um, they don't, that does not mean they don't provide relational databases. They have relational database. For instance, AWS and RBS is a relational database scheme and that is hosted on AWS. What this just means that you don't um, manage it, you don't um, cater for, oh, um, my storage space is full, I need to buy another one. All you have to do is uh, AWS will send you a um, report saying this is almost full. Would you care to upgrade and a host of many other stuff? And then it's readily available. So the security part is being taken, is taken care of by, by the cloud providers. Um, SQL and no SQL. So, um, like I said earlier, the, the different kind of database that we have the relational and the cloud um, databases, they offer SQL and no SQL services. With SQL being the structured query language, which is a standard and um, programming language that is used to manage relational databases and perform various operations on the data in them. What this means is that structured query language SQL is provides uh, a standard uh, a syntax for writing relational database. You are going to see an example of what uh, of what writing a database looks like. Um, so SQL is used to create relational databases, and then if it's uh, like my SQL server, for instance, the relational database. I'll give an example. If it's my SQL server that is running locally on your on your system, you have to configure it in terms of defining the schema and what kind of data you are storing in there. So you, you use the SQL uh, programming language to communicate with this kind of um, databases. And then we have no SQL database, which uh, database designed to be used across large distributed systems. They are notably much more scalable and uh, much faster at handling very large data loads than traditional relational databases. Unlike other databases, no SQL database do not use the standard library relationships. So instead, they use the, the I mean, no SQL database allows for querying and st um, storage of data by a variety of other means, depending on the specific uh, software. So what this is explaining is that no SQL databases are designed to run across large distributed systems. Large distributed systems are systems that are not or there are, that they do not, all their computing power do not stick with one particular system. They have different clusters where all, all, where these are distributed across and then when one fails, the other one kicks that. When, uh, when the other fails, another one kicks that. And the major, the major advantage of this is that when a particular vulnerability happens, it can only affect probably one of them and then the rest will kick start and you that's like guaranteeing you have like 99.9% .9 availability and um, less uh, less insecure. Um, no SQL database do not use the standard um, tabular relationship. By tabular relationship, we mean what we have in our normal CSV, for instance, the CSV that you have been working on since the beginning of this uh, week. Uh, we have the rows and then we have the columns. That is what um, relation now databases uses. For no SQL um, databases, we have the document and then we have the collections. The documents are the rows and then the collections are the table. What this means is that you can, you, you don't have a rigid um, data model or a rigid data schema which says that if this column is not present, you can't create the database. Or if this column is missing, you can't 
creates the row and something like that. But in NoSQL, it gives you uh, access to drop the data the way you want it, and then it's just adjust to what you have given it. And you see an example of what a NoSQL um, database looks like. Advantages of um, SQL databases is that it stores data in a highly structured tabular form with multiple rows and columns. So it is highly structured, uh, like we have in our CSV, our XLSX, and uh, TSV, and the rest. It is highly flexible and um, easy to maintain because you have the defined um, schema. You already have which column is supposed to come before the next column. You already know how this column relates to the next table. So it is easy to maintain and it's highly flexible. Um, they are effective for data stored on a single server. So that is what um, distributed and no, and no SQL database offers us. In relational databases, they are highly effective for, uh, for single servers. So if you have distributed um, server, they don't work so well on that. And that's one of the disadvantage of SQL databases. They don't work so well on distributed uh, systems. Because if you have them distributed and then you have defined the relationship between them, if, for instance, a, a table that is um, related to another table is, is being stored on a different kind of system, the connection at which, I mean, the way you communicate and get data will be, will, you, you will be, will be slower, the response time will be much, much uh, uh, it, will, it will always lag in terms of it will not be fast and that's why they don't work so well on the system and then they are relatively expensive depending on your use case if you are keeping uh, an, an SQL database and then the relationship between them is kind of large and then you have all of these tables in one particular database the more data you store the heavier it gets and then the more expensive it, it will, it, it will to continue to accumulate cost, right? And that's why they are relatively um, expensive. Advantages of um, no SQL databases, uh, it uses inexpensive storage and processing power because you have distributed all of this across. The storage and processing power is relatively cheaper compared to um, the SQL databases. It has high availability and speed. It works significantly better across distributed systems it provides higher level of flexibility with newer data models, and then they are often open source and therefore lower cost. Um, the, the main point here is that it provides high level of flexibility with newer data models. What this means is if you have a no SQL database, uh, for you to create a new um, data model in them is relatively easy. All you have to do is um, instantiate the data model even if you don't have the general information now and then you just keep dropping the data in there and if it changes a new SQL database would uh, would automatically adapt to the new data model and then you continue to save your data and one of the disadvantages is that it's relatively difficult to maintain because you don't know um, at what stage the new data model is you don't know if it is specific to this particular data model or if it has, it has changed based on the data you have pushed into it. Okay, I'm going to go to the uh, meeting and see if there are any comments. Okay, okay. so we just we'll continue. All right. Okay, so this is an example of a no SQL um, database. This is what it looks like. You, if uh, you have been coding since the um, since the beginning of the week, I'm sure you are familiar with this. It looks like a JSON file. Essentially, that is what NoSQL is, because in a JSON file, as you might have known, it is not always, um, some data points are not always present, right? And that's what NoSQL database gives you. If it is not present, NoSQL database says, no problem, just drop them, I will adapt, and then it keeps going. So at some point, maybe the update ads column here might not be present, and then, at some point when you are pushing the data, maybe group table is not present. It does not really matter as long as you are using a new SQL database. Or for instance, in our CSV, if um, updated art is not present and, um, and then you have the column updated art and then you are trying to like create a new column to your um, CSV and then you are using pandas for instance, if, the, if, if a particular data point is missing, it will tell you 
that the length that you have provided is less than the length that it is expecting. Because if you are trying to instantiate a new series, which is like a new color or, or probably message, and then one data point or two data points is missing, you will not be able to create that column with the rest of the uh, columns that you have in your data frame, right? And because that's because it uses a relational SQL database. Okay, but in no SQL database, you can just keep dropping them and then it will automatically adapt and get the, I mean, store the data as you want it. And an example of, a, of an SQL database is our normal CSV, which I have explained. You have the rows, which is this, and then you have the columns. Here, you have data points, right? From this place to this place, it's one data point. From this place to this place, it's one data point. But here, it's one row per data point, okay? That's the difference. And then you have the columns, and then you have the rows. And if any of these rows is missing, you will, um, it, instead of representing it with NAN, probably when you are creating it, you created it with NAN, then it will work. That means it is not missing. That means you have provided a particular value for it. It's just that the value is NAN, all right? But let's assume it's not there, like it's not there at all, then you will not be able to create the columns. Okay. And then the no SQL um, data model, uh, many of the companies now, they are migrating to, they're still, there are still some companies that still uses the SQL kind of data model, but most of the companies now they they are they are more and uh, they like the idea of the no SQL data uh, basis, and then that's why we'll be discussing it in a little bit more detail. Uh, in the no SQL data model, we have the document model, we have the graph model, and then we have the key value model. In the document model. As you know, it's a no SQL databases, and then it replaces the rows and column structure with a document storage model. So each document is structured frequently using the JavaScript object notation, which is the JSON model, and then the document data is associated with object-oriented programming where each document is an object. So as you see, from this place, from this point to this point, that is one object, and in our case here, we call it one data point, okay? One data point. Or here, from this place to this place, that's another object, and that is what the document model is explained. So instead of using the normal, the rows and the columns that we are, are accustomed to, we the, in the document model we use the document um, structure, and then it is is associated with the object-oriented programming where each document is referred to as an object in the data model. Okay, the graph model. It's a no SQL database which uses the graph uh, model. The graph model, for instance, we have an, uh, the most popular um, graph database that I know is the Neo4j. Neo4j database, it uses the graph uh, model to create um, its um, data model and schema. It usually requires all the data to reside on one machine, which negates one of the key advantages of no SQL database. As I said earlier, no SQL um, databases, it's uh, it uses the distributed uh, uh, system structure where each of the computing power and then the storage is distributed across different clusters. But in graph model, it usually likes that all of it resides in one particular machine. Um, particular machine. This class of databases uses structures like data model, edges, and properties, making it easier to model relationship between entities in an application. So graph model is is as you know the, the the graph structure it follows like not entirely the tree structure but the graph structure where we have the nodes and then we have the edges each node is like the object that in the document model that represents a particular data point and then each edge or each um, connection is like a particular table in our sql um, database and an example of the graph model is called is no um, new 40 database and then the key value model is the is, is similar to the json uh, model so it's uh, a key is required to retrieve and update data the key value data model is very simple and therefore scales well however this simplicity and scalability comes at the cost of query complexity what this means is that you can actually ask the data base for um, any particular data without knowing the key. So you can't get a value without knowing the key. So this is like our dictionary in Python. So you can't get a particular value without knowing uh, the key. 
and then you can get more information from the listed site here. Uh, any questions so far? Any questions? Hello. Yeah. I think uh, the data which is shared on uh, Friday folder is not uh, familiar with it's not. this document. Maybe post for us. I think it is. I shared it on the Friday folder. This is yeah. It. Some some of the contents are different. Oh. Some of the slides are different. Yeah, it has a big difference actually. Yours is elaborated. Okay. Um, I I'll check. I'll check again, and then I will. Uh, I will update the folder. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. All right. Uh, let me go to the next slide. So let's discuss. So that's all for the SQL versus uh, no SQL. If you have any questions on that, please send to the chat. I think there are yeah, okay. I, will, I will do that. I will use one to data on the one database. Okay. Yes, yes, you can use uh, multiple um, data models in one um, database system, if it's uh, no SQL. Um, you, so it will be called, you know, a particular data model will define probably one connection and one collection, and then you can have other collections to have other um, data models. Essentially what data model is, I will be explaining later now, is like a simple structure that uh, that says, oh, this, this particular data has this, and this particular data has that. Thank you, that's a particular example. Yeah, you should use graph model. Um, a good use case of graph model is probably when you are, when you are, uh, so, for instance, in a fraud detection system, you can use um, a graph model to then um, to then identify people that you have probably lent money, and then you need to track them. Probably they are not uh, paying on time, so you can use a graph model to like find the different nodes that might be connected to them. Um, I, I don't have much experience with the graph model, but I think a very good use case would be the fraud detection uh, model. Probably you might do something like that if we start uh, with one. Have I answered your question, Mizan? Um, okay. Right. Okay. Um, next slide. Let me let me try and go to that again. Right. So I'm reading. I'm reading this from the folder. Uh, so if there's any mistake, I should be able to detect. All right. So the second part of the tutorial is the database. I mean, database schema design. So a database schema is a skeleton structure that represents the logical view of the entire database. It defines how the data is organized and how the relations among them are associated. It formulates all constraints that are to be applied on the data. You will see an example of a database schema. I'm sorry, this picture is not so clear, but this is what a database schema looks like. All of this that is shaded in gray are the table name, and then the following are the um, columns that are present in there. And this is an example of an SQL database schema. And you can see how the relationships are. You see the lines joining each particular table. So that's like identifying each relationship present in the uh, database. Okay. And from the definition, a database schema is the skeleton structure that represents the logical view of the entire database. It defines how the data is organized and how the relationship among them are associated. So for instance, the associated relationship is the lines that are joining a, from a particular table to the other tables. So it formulates all the constraints that are applied on the data. So if one of the constraints that we might have is probably we have a trigger that says when we push into this particular table, 
update this information from this table. Okay, and before we can do that, there has to exist a particular relation between this table that we are pushing into and the other table that we are updating. A database schema can be divided broadly into two categories. We have the physical database schema. So this schema pertains to the actual storage of data and its form of storage, like files, indices. It defines how the data will be stored in the secondary uh, storage. So if you have like a, uh, uh, a physical So a database schema is divided into two categories, the physical database schema and then the logical database schema. The physical database schema uh, contains the actual storage of the data, where the data is residing, where we're actually storing it, like, uh, like in our file storage system and our hard disk, so we can decide and um, we can design that as our physical um, database schema. While the logical database schema defines all the logical constraints that need to be applied on the data store. And this is where we have the views, the tables, the procedures, and then the integrity constraints. The tables are, as I've ex explained earlier, the different uh, aspects of the database that you are storing. So for instance, the example I gave earlier, the 10 Academy database, we have the GMIT table, we have the um, G class table, we have the um, rocket charts table, we have the trainees table, and host of any other tables. So that's an example of tables. And then we have views. Views are generated from tables. And then uh, what's, what it does is, instead of reading directly from the tables and always writing the, the query to get a particular uh, value out of a particular table, you can just write views. And then you can continuously click on that view or just run the view and get uh, the kind of value that you want from the database. Probably you are always querying um, how many students attend the GMIT today, right? So we have a view that we have created, and all we have to do is run the view, and then we get the total number of students that, that attend a particular uh, GMIT. And then we have um, procedures, and then we have the integrity constraint. Procedures are like set rules that a particular um, table follows. I would say procedures are similar to triggers, but they are, the, the major difference is that um, procedures are like they run um, simple um, calculations and get uh, a particular value that we want, while triggers, while triggers they run when we are about to probably update a particular table or delete a particular um, table or, or create an insert into a particular table. That's what uh, when uh, triggers run. And then we have the integrity constraint. We have the integrity uh, constraints as well, which is like a set of rules that a particular table must follow, or a set of uh, relationships that are present in the particular database. So the difference between physical and logical is, in the logical schema, we have the attributes, but in the physical schema, we do not have the attributes. Uh, in the logical schema and the physical schema, we have the physical, I mean, primary and secondary keys. Primary and secondary keys can be primary and foreign keys. So primary key are keys that uniquely identifies a particular data point, and um, secondary key, which is synonymous to foreign key, is um, our order, uh, are all the columns that are present in our database that forms the relationship between this table and the rest of the um, other table. So for instance, we have uh, a foreign key would be the student's, um, the trainee's ID that uniquely identifies a particular trainee, right? If we want to like get the total number of time a particular trainee attended um, a GMIT, Right? We can, we have to go, you know, we have to like create a relationship between the training table and the GMIS table. And then what will serve as the connection between these two tables will be the trainees ID. 
So whenever we want to get to the number of time a particular trainee attend, we have to like read from the trainee table and then connect it to the GME table so that we can get the information that we need. Because the information we need is residing in the GME table and then we need to like connect them together to get that kind of information. But primary key uniquely identifies a particular data point in the um, in the table. And then the most used primary key is the ID. So we have the product ID for the product table, we have the trainees ID for the trainees table, we have the GMIT ID for the uh, for the GMIT table, we have the G class ID for the G class table, and we have the customer ID for the customer table, depending on the tables that you might have. So ID is the most used uh, for that. And in the logical um, schema, it's not um, compulsory that we have the table names, but we must have them in the physical schema because the physical schema, as you know, is the, is where the data is actually stored. Right? We only define the how the data is in the logical schema and the kind of integrity, the kind of procedures or triggers that we want that we want the database to have. That's what we define in the logical schema. And then we have the column names and then the uh, data types, which has to be present in the physical schema, but then it's not necessarily present in the logical uh, schema. And an example of an SQL database is this schema. A simple Google search of uh, a database schema will give you this image, and then you can, you should be able to like see the relationship between them. And this is what um, defining a, a my SQL database schema looks like, right? So we have um, this is SQL codes, like I've explained earlier. SQL is. Uh, a standard programming language that we use to communicate and create um, relational databases. Right? We also use SQL to create non-relational databases as well. So we have the create table. If not exist, the name of the table is the attendance, uh, and then we have the column names. Right? We have the ID, we have the student ID, we have the join time, the exit time, the date meet code, and then the meeting ID. You can see after we define the column name. We have the data type of the column, and then we have the integrity constraint. The integrity constraint is that this ID must not be not, which is like the not not, and then this ID is auto implementing, which is like even when you are inserting and then you are not inserting the ID, it automatically auto implements itself. Okay? Uh, we have the in student ID as well. We define the data type and we define the integrity constraint, and that is what we have followed for all other column names that we have. After the meeting ID and uh, the, the integrity, we have the primary key which says we are telling this schema that, oh, this is our primary key and then the name is ID. So it goes into the columns that we have defined and it finds ID and then it makes sure it's the primary key. And it will always be the primary key and it will work because we are also incrementing it and then it must not be null. The primary key, one of the integrity is that, or one of the constraints is that a primary key must not be null. It must always have a value. And then we have the index, which is uh, FK training underscore IDX. What this is like, what this is showing us is we have a foreign key that connects to the trainees table, and then it is called student ID. Okay. You know, I was explaining um, what foreign keys um, uh, and primary key is. As you know, we have the primary key and it's called ID. And then our foreign key in this table is the student ID. You can see the student ID here. So for us to create a relationship between the trainee table and the attendance table, we we'll would use the student ID. Okay. And then the student ID will create the relationship that we want, and then we can get any kind of information out of that. Um, we also have the constraint of um, so if the constraint um, name that is creating is called the FK attendance trainees. So what, what this second um, this line constraint is explaining is that if we need to redefine this schema, we just need to delete this FK attendance trainees one. Once we delete this, it will delete the relationship that exists between attendance table and the trainees table. Once we get into uh, week zero, you will see, I mean week one, uh, and then we, we have a project on the database, you will see how this is and how to create one. We'll be creating a particular database later today as well, but it will not be as uh, creating a relationship between tables. It's just one table so that we can complete the um, challenge. All right. And then the foreign key is the student ID, and then reference of I mean reference means where is it getting this foreign key from? Right? Where is it getting this foreign key? It's getting it from the trainees, and what is the primary key 
of um, this training step is, is the applicant uh, ID. Okay, that is what this line is doing. And essentially, we are creating a particular schema, and then in the schema, as I've said, when we create um, a particular um, schema, we have to define all of the constraints, we have to define how it will look like and how it will work, and that is why we need to write all of this out such that when when it is created, the data, I mean, the table is ready for communication and then for analysis, all right? And then on delete, do nothing, and then on update, do nothing. So we can like say on delete, probably we have a trigger that we have written somewhere, and then whenever something is deleted in the attendance table, we just say on delete, on delete of any of the rows or data points that we might have in the attendance table, probably run this trigger, okay? And then on update, run this trigger. So let's assume we have the trigger set. This is where we set uh, where we set what should happen when delete is uh, when a delete operation is performed or when an update uh, operation is performed. Okay. And essentially, in a in a database, we are always doing four things, right? We are either creating a but uh, a data entry or a data point, or we are um, reading from the database, or we are updating, or we are deleting. These are the four major things that we do. And from, look at it here, we are creating, we are setting the delete, and then we are setting the update. You will be reading later today, okay? And then we are, because we are using a MySQL, uh, using the ng in NodeDB, this is like most uh, popular, and that's why we are using it. And then the default character set is utf hmv 4 This has the generic uh, meaning of allowing you to store a different kind of um, data entry. So probably you have MOG or emoticons in the uh, kind of data that you are storing. The default character that you have set here will allow you to store them. And then this correlates to um, collates. And then at the last, I don't really know what this line means. And then we have a comment to say uh, it's storing information about student attendance. Okay, that is what. So essentially, when we run this, it will create the table attendance if it does not exist. And then attendance table would have. The ID colon, the student ID, the join time, exit time, date, meet code, and meeting ID. The primary key for this table would be ID, and then it is connected to the trainees table with the foreign key student ID, and then the trainees table has the primary key applicant ID. Okay, I'm going to pause here and then see if we have questions. Question. Thanks. I missed a lot. Sorry. Uh, I'm looking forward to the question start. Right. Okay. Uh, most cases ID is supposed to but you know if you have auto incrementing ID it's kind of difficult for you to track which data points you are um, you are trying to target, okay? So, for instance, if you are trying to create a relationship between the customers and then the product, the, and sorry, from the customers and then the product, probably want to find which customer has bought with what product. So, when you, have, you need to have the product ID as a primary key for the product table, and then you need to have the customer ID as a primary key for the customer table, and then you need to create a relationship between the product ID, I mean, product table, and then the customer table. So. For you to uniquely identify uh, it, which customer has bought which product, you can probably just use the product ID. So, and then you have to use the orders table to create that kind of a relationship. So, in most cases, uh, ID is, is is sufficient, but you know you have to uniquely define that ID. It has to be. It's sometimes it's not the primary key ID that is sufficient, but another uh, ID, probably the student ID. You know, we already have the ID in the training table can also have a student ID that uniquely identifies the student. Or well, in most cases, it's always sufficient. Uh, okay. I would I would receive, share this. I, it's in the Friday's folder. You can check it out. You should get it. Yeah, thank you, Pedersen. Uh, okay. We have multiple columns in the primary key. Yes, you can have more than one column in the primary key. You can have more than one column in the primary key. What that means is that you have um, two uh, primary keys, right? So you can have ID and still have the student ID, or you can have other things. Okay. 
So you can specify them with like um, ID one and then ID two. So you put a a, a, a comma there. All right. Oh, there is no confusion. Uh, uh, yeah, Christian. Yeah. No, no, no. You, you, you can, you can have. Wait, let me, let me think through it so that I don't make a mistake. Okay. Okay. There's a lot of discussion going on. Uh, it's not from the people on my table. Yes, so that is what I'm saying. So you can have like a you can have a training table, and then you have probably when you create the foreign connections, you can have the uh, the ID, and then still have the product ID, and then still have the customer ID. All of this uniquely identifying a particular thing. So you can have two or more. I mean, you can have more than one primary. Key. Is this clear? Hello. Yeah. Um, what I was asking is, like, in what instance would we need to have, like, more than one column as the primary key? Is it like when you have a table and then the columns are maybe foreign keys? So to be able to uniquely identify the, that table, you combine two columns. Yes, that is actually right. What you said is actually right. So if like um, a table is, um, you have more than, you have like a particular table there, and then you have the primary key there, and then you need to create this uh, a connection between the other tables, you can have more than one primary key to uniquely identify each data point in the other table. And then there will be like a foreign key from the other table. Is this clear to everybody? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes, I'll go on. Okay. All right, thank you. I just think I should sort of put an addition. So, again, like my colleague already mentioned, a primary key is to uniquely identify all the entries you have in the table. And again, it's very important to know that relational database is primarily relational because you can relate the several tables that make up the database. So, in a particular in a, in a particular table, if you should have more than one primary key, the most important thing is to know that primary key it has to be unique for every entry and it cannot be null. So you can have more than one primary key in a particular table. And in that instance, the only thing it is facilitating is to help you in connecting to different tables. So there is no one other factor to whether you have just one primary key, whether you have one just foreign key. There might even be instances where your primary key is also the foreign key, like it's also the key that is joining it up with another table. So the most important thing is to know that the primary key is, it ensures the uniqueness of the of, of the table, while the foreign key ensures the reference and integrity of the table, making it possible for us to like relate it to the other one. So I hope that's all. Okay. All right. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Raul. I hope that clears um, um, most of the questions or uh, that that we might have. So um, to answer Fantali's question, it is not compulsory for a non-SQL database, or uh, yeah, non-SQL database to have primary key, but they can have, right? The example I gave here, I think it's here, is it here? Oh, maybe it's in the other slide. Right. The example I gave here, if you noticed, let me just present so you see. If you notice, we have the ID and then the ID and then it's uniquely identifying this data point. It is nice to have, but it's not compulsory because it's no SQL, right? So even if it's not present, it works well. Okay. All right. Okay. Yeah. Where are we? Okay. So. I hope that answers all of the questions. Now, this is what a data model for an order management system looks like. And this is creating a connection now. So a data model is like, we just have all of these tables, and then we are saying this table will be related to this table, and the other table will be related to the other table. So a data model and um, a data um, schema is, uh, is similar. Uh, the major difference between them, which we'll see um, later on, is like 
in a data schema, we create the skeleton and then we specify the different column names that are supposed to be there and then how they relate. Or in, in a data model, we have the different kinds of um, tables that we're supposed to have and then how these tables would connect to one another. And then this is an example of the data uh, model. So we have the customers that is related to the orders. We have the orders that is giving information to the invoice. We have all, or if you notice, this one has a one to many relationship between customers and orders. And then the order has a one to many relationship between the order and the other item. And then the product also has a one to many relationship between the other item. And then the product also has one to many relationship to the invoice item and the invoice or the invoice item has a many to one relationship between uh, uh, inbox and then the invoice uh, item, right? These are different kinds of relationship that exist. What um, one to many means is that um, you can only have one invoice for all uh, different number of uh, um, invoice uh, item. A, a very good example would be uh, a particular order, right? So a particular order would have many items, right? So you can buy many products. And that's why you can see product as one to many, and to many uh, in order, one to many relationship between the product and the other item. Okay. And uh, these are references that would help you learn more about what I have discussed. Let me go back to it and then answer the questions. Never mind. Okay. So, um, do, do you have any questions? For the hands-on session on how to create a um, database, we would have that um, later today. And then we'll be creating a MySQL um, database. I would, uh, I would employ us to go and download uh, MySQL and then have it set up on our uh, Linux or Mac or Windows system, whichever we are, we are using, because we'll be required to create a table as well as store data into it and then read from that. Can we export the databases we create? Um, and for Windows, when we create a database, it's always um, present. For instance, if we use my SQL server, we can SQL it. Yeah, I, I think it might serve the purpose, but it's just that the tutorial will be based on my SQL, and SQL should serve the purpose as well. Uh, for my SQL, if we use SQL server, we should be able to ex export the database, but I've not um, tried exporting the database created with my. Um, it's um, SQL here. Okay, if I find something, I'll let you know. And there are different flavors of SQL. Okay, that um, Christian. There are different flavors of um, SQL. So my SQL is a database instance. SQLite is a database instance. The there there exists only simple. I can't even differentiate the difference between them because they, you essentially write. The same thing for the only that in my SQL in my SQL we have engines like we have different engines like the InnoDB that you see in SQL Lite we don't have that right we just create the database and I think SQL Lite is I think it's for um, testing phase and my SQL is like well known and like you can use it on a bigger project so to say it's not like you can't use SQL Lite on a bigger project as well but I, I just feel my SQL is like, um, it's, it has more of this um, structure around it, and SQLite has structure as well, but not as much as the my SQL. There exists only small difference between them. Okay. So if you have like um, any questions, set, um, setting it up, like just, um, I think, screenshot it and send to tutorial. So all of us is ready before the hands-on session comes later today, and then we should be able to like, uh, go through it together. Okay. So essentially what we'll be doing in the hands-on session is we'll be creating a database, MySQL. We would be, we'll create a table in the database, just one table. You can decide to extend it later on, and then just one table, and then we'll be reading from a particular CSV file straight into the databases, and then we will not, I mean the database, and then we will now read Yes, a particular link has been provided on the uh, document that you can use to install it, and then that link has um, installation files for Windows, Linux, and Mac. You can install the MySQL community just to make everything easy, right? 
and then we'll create the tables in the database and after that we'll read directly from the database and use that to build dashboards on uh, StreamIt. If you are familiar with other databases, please try it out. Okay? And then if you learn something new, please share it with us so that we can learn from you as well. All right. Okay. Any other questions? Um, no SQL. They are, you know, depending on the different NoSQL um, technologies that you use, then you can have um, different, um, uh, another language different from SQL. For, for instance, we have the, uh, let me try and recall, we have the, uh, uh, it's, not, it's not coming on my head, but it's kind of popular. Uh, it's a, it's a NoSQL where we write um, queries. It is called, I, I can't recall now, right? But yes, there are other languages that we can use to create new SQL databases, depending on the flavor that you use. It's in the document. Just go to task four. You will see it. Task four under the with zero document. You see. Today's task will be um, uploaded very soon because we have not like go through the tutorials together. That's why it's not live now because you require to create database and then you know, visualization. But what today's start entails is that you build dashboards and then you create a database. I just can't remember it. No SQL. It uses a quick I don't know. I can't recall. But, but if I get something, I'll let you know. I'll tag you on tutorial and I'll send to you this thing. Okay? Are we all clear? Let's keep working on our um, challenge that we have from Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and then once we do the tutorial for Friday, you can you can work on it and submit. Mind you, there is no specific ad deadline. You can when, once you make new changes, you feel you have so you have successfully uh, complete the requirement for the exercise. Just just submit, right? So you don't mind uh, late submissions. Okay. Thanks, uh, Mufampai. Any other questions? Stay and email. I Like I said, the link is in the week zero. Okay, you can still see my screen. So let me just open the week zero. So you see, I'm sure all of us has, um, have access to this. Yeah. Just wait for it to do. Okay. Yeah, so this is it, right? Once you click on download here, you go to these um, options, and then you can install for whichever system you're using. So for Linux, you click your Linux um, version. For Ubuntu, for Fedora, for whatever that you might be using, you can you know, just install. Okay, and then I think. Uh, what do you select? So for Windows, you have to click on Windows and then it refreshes for you and then you can download, right? So you can just install this, download, and then you have it. And then for Mac, you just do Macintosh, what is, what is Macintosh? Yeah. And then you can download. Okay, it's not. All right. So if, if you have any other questions, Tag anybody on the uh, tutorial, tag me, tag Usman, Frank Lawa, we'll be happy to help. Okay? Thank you very much for coming to the uh, session. I hope you learned something. And let's keep building. All right? See you on RC. Cheers, guys.